Good morning or perhaps good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. It's now the top of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and kick things off for today. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for the Military Families Learning Network. It's my pleasure to welcome you to session two of the inaugural Military Family Readiness Academy. The Academy is host to an annual programming series designed for military family service providers working in any field. Each series will fe feature multiple sessions as well as unique engagement opportunities such as this year's Outpost and Outpost Online. Today's session, Impacts and Responses in Disaster and Hazard Readiness, is the second installment of our three-part series, Disaster and Hazard Readiness Foundations. In the spring of 2021, we will continue the conversation by delving into disaster and hazard readiness in action with part two of the Military Family Readiness Academy. Do be sure to sign up for the military, or excuse me, for the Academy mailing list for updates and to access the Outpost newsletter, as well as the Outpost online discussion forum, which is help, happening between sessions. You can sign up for the Academy homepage, uh, which we'll place that link here in the chat pod in just a moment. In case you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around today. Hopefully you're currently able to view the slides. If you're unable to see them or having any other technical difficulties, you can reach out for, to us via email for tech support to milfamln at gmail.com. You can download the slides as well as the resources on our session page today. We'll place that link in the chat pod here in just one moment. As many of you have already done, we do look forward to having you join us in the chat pod today for conversation and for questions as well as hellos. To embed the chat pod so you don't miss any links or conversation, simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You should then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen and then from there you can select the chat bubble icon. When typing your comments or questions, please do be sure to select the all panelists and attendees response option from the drop down menu. It's uh, located right above where it says type message here. This just ensures everyone is able to view our conversation in the chat today and facilitates a much, much more robust understanding. We'll also be covering evaluation and continuing education information at the end of today's session. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD USDA partnership for military families and our passion is to connect military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research and to each other through innovative online programming. It's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this fall series, as well as today's guest speaker, Dr. Keith Tidball. Dr. Tidball is the PI for the MFLN's Community Capacity Concentration Area. He is also the Associate Director for Environment and Natural Resources with Cornell Cooperative Extension and holds an appointment as Senior Extension Associate in the Department of Natural Resources. In addition to his extension roles, Dr. Tidball also currently serves as a commander with the 2nd Detachment of the 10th Area Command with the New York Guard. It's now my pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Tidball to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you very much, Coral. It's a great pleasure to be with you once again for this second edition um, of the Military Family Readiness Academy. It's, a, it's also a great pleasure to introduce our facilitator for part two of the Military Family Readiness Academy, Dr. Angie Lindsay. Dr. Lindsay is an assistant professor at the University of Florida in the Department of Family, Youth and Community Sciences. And her research focuses on disaster preparedness and recovery within rural communities, looking at crisis communication efforts before, during and after disasters. Her extension work has been in partnership with extension and organizations to meet gaps and needs within communities affected by disaster. Dr. Lindsay has worked on several large interdisciplinary projects, including the Healthy Gulf, Healthy Communities Project, which is focused on resiliency and rebuilding of Gulf Coast communities following the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Dr. Lindsay, or Angie, it's great to have you here with us again today. Please take it away. Thanks, Keith, and thanks, Coral, as well. And uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks so much um, for joining us this morning. Uh, it's so exciting to see where everyone is coming from and uh, all the different places all over our lovely globe this morning. Uh, I am here in lovely Gainesville, Florida, where it's kind of muggy, thanks to Hurricane Zeta to the left of us. So uh, our thoughts and prayers are with our family and friends to the, to the left portion of Florida and Pensacola, but also Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana, poor Louisiana has, has gotten the brunt of the hurricane season this year. So we're definitely thinking about everybody uh, today as Hurricane Zeta gets closer to, uh, gets closer to the coast there. So I'm um, 
very excited to talk to you about today and what uh, we're going to be talking about with impacts. But I first wanted to introduce myself for those of you that were not part of the first session, uh, a little bit more about me. So that picture up there on the right is yours truly, uh, many, many years ago. So I am originally from South Carolina. I think I saw Pam was uh, joining us from South Carolina. So hi, welcome from a fellow South Carolinian. Uh, but back in 1989, we had Hurricane Hugo come across uh, South Carolina. And at the time, my father worked for the South Carolina Department of Agriculture, and he was very involved in the Emergency Operations Center and the EOC there. And I was a high school sophomore. And they, uh, after Hurricane Hugo went through, they needed somebody to come answer phones and take donations to help some folks out and yours truly had their picture made. So uh, my dad likes to say that he is the one the responsible for my interest in, in crisis and disasters and managing uh, both. So uh, definitely an interest in crisis communication. My education background is indeed in, in communication. Undergraduate is from crisis, is, is in corporate communication from the College of Charleston in Charleston, South Carolina. And I have two degrees from University of Florida. Uh, so before I came back for my PhD, I, I did work in the nonprofit world for a little over 10 years. I was a public relations manager at the Jacksonville Zoo in Jacksonville, Florida. And then I was an executive director of North Florida affiliate of Susan G. Cummins for the Cure for about eight years. I came, found my way back to Gatorland and the Gator Nation to get my PhD. Uh, and now uh, I am a, an assistant professor in the Department of Family, Youth, and Community Sciences. I also work with the Public Issues Education Center uh, here on campus. And then probably the most important work in relation to my, my role here today is that I am the Florida Extension Disaster Education Network point of contact for, uh, for the University of Florida IFAS, which is the Institute of Food and Agricultural Science. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, through the presentation today as well. So just want to give you all a little bit more about me and, and my role here today. So uh, we always like to start with some objectives and what we're gonna be talking about today. So today we're gonna to talk about, discuss at least 10 of the impacts from hazards and disasters from overall impacts to impacts that are on individuals and families as well. Determine at least five factors that impact community response and recovery and identify three tools and tactics that communities use to respond to and recover from hazards and disasters. And like Coral said, I, I definitely going to be using the chat box. I would love to hear from, from y'all some of the things that your community does and some of the impacts as well you've seen after disaster. So welcome your comments in the chat box. And I, I, I will have slides for those as well. So of, of course, and I, and I love this slide, uh, and I think it really sets the tone for what we're going to be talking about today and the unique challenges that military families have in disaster preparedness, mitigation, recovery, and response as well. Uh, it's a crucial part of any community, obviously. We, we are all involved in disaster preparedness and mitigation and recovery, but for military families, preparing for disaster can look differently compared to the civilian population. Military families have additional documents to keep track of. Uh, they can be separated from family members. They may have family members with special needs. Uh, someone may be stationed outside of the United States, uh, definitely not in their comfort zone or what they're familiar with. And additionally, National Guard service may be deployed to state active duty to get personally involved in disaster response and recovery, and may therefore be away from the home as the rest of the family copes. So. Uh, when response and recovery are, are critical, oftentimes some of these folks are, after, are often deployed, which would uh, be very stressful for a family. So definitely wanted to start with some of the unique challenges of looking at disaster preparedness and in response and recovery, especially with military families and military communities. Okay, so just to kind of recap, recap some of the session one, some of the things that we actually went over uh, last month in session one, we did talk about different types of disasters and different terminology, the difference between hazards and disasters. We also talked about phases of management also. Uh, and we also looked at some of the, the guiding research that's out there regarding uh, disaster management as well as hazard and disaster uh, research that's out there. And then talked about looking at the phases of management, that integrated disaster management that you get from the federal level, the state level, and the local level. And that local level includes some of those different organizations, including the COADS, which are community organizations active in disasters, VOADS, which is volunteer organizations active in disasters, 
community organizations. These are our nonprofits, our NGOs that, that work within our communities and sometimes can be truly the pillars um, after a disaster. Extension, and then Eden, again, the Extension Disaster Education Network. So some of those organizations that work at that local level. And the recording and resources from that particular session can be found at that link below. So I'm now I'm gonna, gonna turn a question over to, to y'all to begin our discussion. What are some of the short-term and long-term impacts from disaster? Uh, and this doesn't have to be detailed. You can do one, one, one word or one quick sentence, whatever uh, is easy, just something, health, absolutely. Trauma, finances, evacuations, relocation, shock. Yes, all that. Property damage, communication, displacement, damage, great. Recovery, shelter, loss of home, short-term impacts, back on your feet, stress, stress, yes, lodging, disruption. So great, Keep that. those are great. Those are some really great impacts that y'all are putting in there, thank you. And I think a lot of these have been uh, captured here to the right, and I think you have added some additional ones to them as well. But uh, everyone's exactly right. I see anxiety, shortages, long-term PSD, education, yes, mental health. Individual, family, community, economic, social, mental, environment, agricultural and food security, infrastructure, housing. And again, just like many of y'all are putting in the chat box here, there are so many more different impacts. And some of those impacts are very much individualized and, and based upon the family and what some of their special circumstances may be, especially with military families. But these impacts are very multifaceted and I say multi-leveled as well. And there's a lot of overlap between many of these too, as many of y'all have uh, indicated in the chat box there as well. So I, I like these, NOAA actually does uh, one of these uh, infographics like this every year showing the billion dollar weather and climate disasters that have impacted the United States. Uh, this one is actually, they just updated it in September for 2020. It includes the wildfires out to the left, but it also includes some of the hurricanes that have impacted some of the Gulf Coast states there in the Southeast as well. Also some of the major storms that were impacting the Midwest. Uh, and as you can see there in the middle of the drought and heat wave of summer and fall of 2020. So this is, this is a lot for us to only uh, be within what are we, five months into the year? Uh, so this is a lot for 2020. And so these impacts are, again, we're going through a lot of these impacts right now. Um, but in addition to some of the impacts from these billion dollar weather and climate disasters, we're also dealing with a global pandemic as well. So these impacts are, again, multifaceted and multi-leveled and, and many of them have been going on for several, for a very long time, uh, given the, the pandemic, but also the impacts from these uh, disasters as well. So, and several of y'all, and I greatly appreciate this, though, have touched on the mental health and the social and mental health impacts that uh, come from these types of, uh, these types of, of disasters and hazards. And I, I just wanted to give a kind of a personal story from some of the work that I've done here in Florida after Hurricane Michael, and Hurricane Michael was a category five uh, that impacted the panhandle of Florida, the northwest of Florida. And we had um, many extension folks in that particular area and about 92% of our extension folks had personal damage and many of our extension uh, folks lost their homes completely. Some of them are still trying to rebuild after uh, Hurricane Michael from two years ago. And it was really, it was, so I was actually deployed to go and, and, and help over in that area. And it was, uh, seeing some of the social and mental health impacts was was really difficult and really trying to understand how do we help our people through some of these uh, mental health impacts. Uh, so this was something for me uh, in working in disasters and hazards and response and recovery that really hit home after Hurricane Michael of those impacts that can, that can be uh, very hard for folks. Uh, and disasters we know are undisputed stressful events for folks throughout the world and within just within the US it's estimated that 2 million individuals are impacted personally and or property damage from disasters. And personal impacts in addition to immediate community and economic impacts can increase that stress even more can increase that anxiety and increase that stress. And then prolonged psychological stress following disaster can lead to PTSD. And I think several of y'all uh, commented on that in the chat box. And it's absolutely something uh, that can definitely lead to the PTSD as well. 
So just real quick, what are some, and some of y'all have already mentioned these in there, but are there some other social mental impacts from disasters that maybe you have seen in addition to, I see some of them already have their separation anxiety, um, family separation, suicide, loss of church, 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 um, church maybe. <laughs> Uh, any other anxiety? Yes, lots of anxiety, depression, brain fog. Yes, worry and stress, loss of support group. Yes, loss of that 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 connection, those connections, sleep issues. Absolutely, insomnia, helplessness. Yes, that's a really good point, Michael. Sometimes disaster doesn't even have to occur in the community dealing with the after effects. Absolutely, isolation, fear, hunger issues, depression. These are all great. Thank y'all very much. Anger, very good, absolutely. Some of the same issues that we're seeing with COVID-19, absolutely, Brian. And again, it's it's difficult when we're dealing with a climate or weather-related disaster on top of a global pandemic as well. I agree, short fuses. Great, these are wonderful. And again, many of y'all have already uh, touched on these. Uh, again, PTSD, acute stress disorder, trouble sleeping. Some of you mentioned that as well. Worry, anxiety, fear, sadness, and depression. Often see a um, uptick of increased use of tobacco and alcohol, alcohol, substance abuse. And then obviously the stress on relationships. Somebody said short fuses, absolutely. I think uh, all of us have probably had some short fuses with our family members as all of us were, have been together uh, doing school with, together and doing work from home. Uh, I know in my own family, uh, we've been at each other's throats a couple of times. So absolutely, it's stress on the families and, and, and can be a very big impact as well. In, in addition, and I talked a little bit of this about during the first session as well, but different types of disasters can also, also have different types of impacts as well. Uh, your technological or responsible party uh, types of disasters, this would be the, like the oil spill. And again, uh, like uh, Dr. Tidball mentioned, a lot of my research has been in the response and recovery after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. These types of disasters may have more long-term effects than natural disasters because of community distress, disruption, and dis and distrust and misperceptions. Uh, some of the folks from the University of Southern Alabama, Paku, Marshall, and Gill did a great deal of research in this, especially after the Exxon Valdez, and then they continued some of their research with oil spill after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill as well. A lot of their research concluded that these disasters were often more psychologically distressful than natural disasters for individuals. And even in my own research, uh, and talking with individuals after the Deepwater Horizon oil spell, many of them said, we know what to do after a natural disaster. You know, we're familiar with what to do uh, if there's a tropical storm coming or if there's a hurricane. You know, we, we get out our tools and we go next door and we try to help our neighbors. But with the, the, the Deepwater Horizon oil spell, they kind of felt like they were sitting on their hands and wasn't, weren't real sure what to do. So it was a stressful time. I think somebody even mentioned in the actual chat, bo chat box that it's a feeling of helplessness. And I think some of that that we heard back in, from some of the research was that feeling of helplessness and not knowing what to do. Uh, communities do tend to come together for natural disasters and climate and weather related disasters and collaborate efforts, but they tend to focus on litigation and responsible party for technological technological disasters. Uh, a lot of blame game and finger pointing. And we saw this after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, especially with some of the payouts from BP. Oh, well, so-and-so got this money for their boat, but we didn't. Uh, so it's just a different uh, way of looking at disasters and the impacts they can have, especially those psychological impacts also. So looking at community response overall, there's four response phases, and I'm sure many of you have seen this in your own communities as well after a disaster. You first have that heroic stage, and I mentioned that a little bit earlier in some of the research that we've done here at the University of Florida. Several folks say that, you know, I know what to do. I go outside. I'm here to help. What can I do to help? I'm going to get this tree up off my neighbor's uh, driveway so they can get out. Uh, and it's very much so of a heroic, we're gonna help each other, we're gonna get through this. And so that leads to the, the honeymoon stage of, oh my gosh, I love my community. This is a great way for us to come together. This has been fantastic. 
then disillusionment starts to starts to kick in. And this is when we're a little bit further away from uh, from the actual disaster. And you're starting to see, well, maybe my, that insurance claim has not come through yet. And this is taking longer to get back to normal as we thought. So some of that disillusionment kind of kicks in a little bit of as folks are starting to get into more of, of the recovery stage and really uh, maybe some frustration that they're not recovering as fast as they'd like. And lastly, the recovery and reconstruction, which can go on for many years. I mentioned Hurricane Michael earlier in the Northwest uh, Florida and Panhandle, and recovery is still going in, reconstruction is still going on on that area. Here we are two years later. So uh, it's a great comments in the chat box too, absolutely, that um, takes a lot too long for things to get back to normal. Insurance never pays for things. Absolutely, Kathy, that's definitely some of the, some of the disillusionment and things that you see coming disillusionment to recovery and re reconstruction as well. And again, I, I, I definitely wanna stress the unique responses for military families as well. And if you look there on the bottom, uh, looking at disasters and the impact it has, everyone is impacted. So the, at a baseline, everyone is impacted in some way. But then you add the extra layer of stress of a family member is deployed or an, another la layer of a family member has to deploy after the disaster. Or you also have a, an additional layer of possibly a family member with special needs and then a damage to home and or important documents. And again, the family member is deployed and the support system network is disrupted. Uh, somebody mentioned that in the chat box when your network is disrupted and in a lot of cases, uh, some folks aren't able to rebuild. Uh, we saw that after obviously Hurricane Katrina where folks just moved out of the area. So sometimes that support system uh, is completely disrupted as well. And military families can have one of these additional uh, layers of stress or they can have many of them or all of them at one time. So it's that extra layer of stress, that psychological stress and mental health impacts uh, that you wanna look at is a re unique response for military families. So what are some other unique challenges that military families may face in the aftermath of disaster that maybe y'all have seen or uh, have experienced? BCS scene, okay. relocation concerns. Okay, great. Deployment, PCS, special needs, shared resources, great. Difficulty assessing resources, lack of communication, healthcare, no family around to help. Pregnancy care is limited, anxiety, loss of employment due to sudden move, yes away from support systems, great. Limited medical in the area. Proper bug out, deployed parent is not present. Wow, yeah. Selling home, limited empathy. Mm. Household goods in one location and physically lined living somewhere else. Great, these are all really unique challenges. Bridges down, absolutely. Transportation, not being able to get where you need to go. These are some great challenges. Thank y'all. So I wanna go a little bit more into some of the factors that impact community recovery overall. Obviously the location of the community and, and where they are and rural areas may, also, may get a less attention than some of our urban areas as well. Also, like I mentioned before, the type of, the type of disaster Military communities and military families, and many of y'all are, are providing some of the unique challenges that military families and military communities face in times of disaster, but also that availability of resources, including the immediate, immediately post-disaster moving into that long term as well, uh, can impact that community recovery as well. And lastly, the extent of damage or the scope of devastation, uh, depending upon how how impacted a place was by the devastation, it takes uh takes a long time for to recover in those particular areas. And looking at the location of community in rural areas may get less attention. And this is something that I think all of us understand definitely. And, but one of the things that we saw here in Florida after Hurricane Irma was that we had pockets of what I call pockets of rural areas. So we had uh, communities of farm workers that were in urban areas, but they were kind of in pockets of rural areas in South Florida. 
And several of our extension agents reached out to me and said, you know, these folks aren't getting the same resources that others are, and there can be language barriers, et cetera. So not only understanding if it's a rural community or if it's an urban community, but also understanding that a lot of our urban communities have what these pockets of rural areas or these certain, certain communities that may have a language barrier or may have a technology barrier that aren't able to get some of their uh, information the same way that other urban folks may be getting. And so in the case with Irma, we were able to print out a good many fact sheets and actually get it to our extension folks and get it down there to them in South Florida so they could basically hand out man, grassroots communication, that one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face communication, hand out some of this information to some of these uh, rural pockets and these urban areas and farm worker communities to make sure that they had the information in their language and it was easy to understand. So, um, so it was just something that we need to keep in mind that obviously we think about rural communities versus urban communities, but there's a lot of rural pockets in some of these urban areas as well. Uh, and other area, other things back factoring uh, impacting re community recovery can be compound disasters. And again, we, we've talked a little bit about that we're living in a time of a global pandemic. And some of these, I mean, you saw from the chart from the NOAA, there's been a lot of weather and climate related disasters on top of already dealing with a disaster. So it's that, that compound disasters as well. And I also want to also talk about some chronic stressors in communities as well. We saw this in some of the rural communities that we work with um, in the Panhandle after the Deepwater Horizon oil sale. Many of them said, we're a community living in a crisis that was interrupted by a disaster. Uh, it's one of my favorite quotes from one of, our one of my favorite community partners. And what he meant by that is they were in a rural community that deals with substance abuse and cyclical poverty that was interrupted by the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, which exasperated some of the problems that were already within that community. So it's important to look at compound disasters like a global pandemic and obviously a climate or weather related uh, hazard, but also some of the stressors or chronic stressors that are already in some of these communities as well. Uh, the breakup of the social networks in a community, I know many of you have already talked about this in the chat box, that uh, some of the social networks and some of the folks that uh, you considered your, your friends and even your family, uh, those have been broken up after disasters for different reasons, whether folks just, just chose not to rebuild or they moved away completely. Uneven recovery, that goes a little bit back to uh, what I was talking about with some of the farm worker communities back in South Florida, that even though they were in urban areas, they had special needs and special circumstances that didn't allow them to recover at the same rate some of the other parts of the community were recovering. And then cascading events. This is, this is uh, we're seeing a lot of this now after COVID-19 or with COVID-19, but some of this can be some of the imp imp economic impacts after a disaster. So you have the actual disaster itself, but the economic impacts afterwards can last for a very long time. So cascading events, uh, one's causing the other a little bit. Hey, Angie, uh, yes. this talk uh, to, to um, drill down a little bit on what, something that you just said in the previous slide there. There's some chat in uh, some, some conversation in the chat uh, around um, sort of the uneven recovery and how that might relate to um, disparities in, in, in certain communities, especially low income communities. Can you talk a little bit more about what, what you've seen there whether urban or rural uh, in terms of those disparities and how that might play out? Sure, absolutely. Um, speaking from my own spirit, uh, experience, uh, we found that, uh, you know, kind of a, a lack of technology and, uh, you know, lack of technology during, during blue skies when there wasn't a hurricane coming uh, or there wasn't a tropical storm coming, but that they didn't have the access to the technology at, at their own homes where they were able to look up and find maybe how, how to prepare a, a plan or how to prepare a recovery plan or, or what are the things that I need to put in a to-go bag if I need to evacuate. Uh, so it, it was really, it's been really important for us to reach out to uh, those communities through some of the areas that they frequent often. So we work with uh, some of the church communities in these areas. Uh, we also work really closely with some of the community service organizations and nonprofits in this area that work really closely with some of these communities. Uh, and a lot of it is that that face to face that let me hand you a piece of paper and let me talk to you about this. And, it, and it's more that grassroots communication, um, but it's with the, those trusted sources. So finding some of those trusted sources within those communities. And again, uh, many of them 
are very heavy in some of the church-based organizations, but also some of the nonprofits within the communities and partnering with those to get the information to them so that they can disseminate it out the best way. They already have the lines of communication open with them. They already have the trust. Uh, so that's been really helpful for us of, of, of making those partnerships, especially with some of the community service organizations and nonprofits and churches in the area to try to reach some of those hard to reach areas. Thanks, Keith. That's a great question. Okay, so um, what leads to better outcomes? So we're going to get a little bit into community capacity building, which I know is something that uh, the Military Family Learning Network has done a great deal on and has some really good resources available as well. Uh, but some of these that leads to better outcomes include the positive outlook and comforting beliefs. And the support network, but we, you know, we just talked about sometimes that support network is not there or they don't come back or they are not able to rebuild in that particular area. But having that support network still there can be really important. A high self-esteem, open and supportive communication, able to adapt, that adaptability, the flexibility to adapt, and, and also the, the having the economic and financial abilities to adapt is also so important as well. The military community and the in the and the network of the military community and the response and the re resources available to the military community are uh, leading to better outcomes as well. And then also some of those community resources also, including some of your community service organizations, your nonprofit organizations, and those resources that are available within their communities. And it's tough because a lot of these organizations and a lot of these resources are impacted after disasters as well. We certainly saw that after Hurricane Michael here in Florida, uh, they are impacted as well. And so a lot of times what you see is folks that uh, relied on a certain resource or a certain organization, that organization was impacted as well. Um, and so therefore it was like, well, what was our plan B? So it, it kind of showed the importance of, you know, what's your plan B if plan A uh, was also impacted and they are not able to provide the resource that they normally are as well. So I did mention some of the resources that the Military Family Learning Network has in community capacity building, but wanted to include a slide here too so that you could see it. Uh, building tools, it has some checklists some worksheets in addition to some research that guides some of the focus groups and surveys. And it all works together. Enhanced community capacity provides ability for communities to bounce forward after disasters, to, to bounce back, to, to bounce forward from keeping what they valued in the community before the disaster and keeping that and moving forward in the recovery and re recovery stage as well. Angie, one thing I would add there uh, before you ask this question is that if, if folks are interested in uh, some of the resources on the community capacity building uh, area for the Military Families Learning Network, there is also uh, a link to a community capacity inventory where you as practitioners and the people that you work with can actually inventory your community capacity. And you can do that with the lens of what happens if I were to experience a disaster. So I would encourage you to, to check out that community capacity inventory tool uh, if you uh, have the chance. Great point, Keith. Yeah, that's definitely one that we've used a lot um, here in Florida as well. So thank you. Okay, so a quick question here. What are some of the community capacity building efforts that you've seen in your own communities? CERT was reinstated. Oh, that's great. Wonderful. Other community capacity efforts. CERT, okay, great. Outreach to underserved communities, wonderful. Local city providing support services, volunteer opportunities, fantastic. Red Cross, food pantries, absolutely. They're, they're instrumental in times. Awareness campaigns for dealing with disasters during COVID. Military and community joint exercises, wonderful. Renewed emphasis on amateur radio. Yes, thank you, Keith. We're seeing more and more with radio these days. Absolutely. Military community alliances, drive through flu shots, very smart. Disaster response team joint collaborations, awesome. Food pantries, Facebook groups, churches working with food pantries and local community grassroots organizations, wonderful. I love seeing these organizations work together. I think it's one of the reasons I've gotten really into the disaster stuff. I love to see the collaboration among organizations to meet the needs within the communities. COVID testing sites, yes. 
seen that in my own community. Absolutely. Community provided additional cell network access to insulate. Oh, wow. Interesting. Vet organization providing food for military. Awesome. Fantastic. These are some really great community capacity building efforts. Increase volunteer infant care, monitor child trafficking, lost children. Wow. Interesting. These are fantastic. Thank you. So uh, just some of the community resources, and, and we've mentioned some of these and throughout the presentation, and many of y'all have mentioned these within the, the chat box too, but looking at some of these community resource and community service organizations and, and some of these pillars of communities that come together in times of disasters as well. Obviously, corporate, cooperative extension. Uh, we're lucky here in Florida, we have uh, 67 counties. We have an extension office in each one of our counties. So, and each one of our counties is involved in disaster preparedness, mitigation, response, and recovery in some regard. So uh, we're very lucky. And then obviously the extension disaster education work, which is the Eden network. Uh, we are a national uh, network of folks uh, throughout uh, extension and Red Cross, Salvation Army. Several of y'all mentioned these as well. Faith-based disaster response groups, all hands volunteers, Team Rubicon, which we worked with after Hurricane Michael, AmeriCorps, Senior Corps, Military One Source, including Military Family Readiness, Direct Relief and International Insurance Organizations uh, sometimes have these uh, nonprofits or service or arms of, uh, of their insurance companies as well that can be very helpful after disasters with helping people fill out some of the insurance paperwork and guiding them through that process as well. And then COADS, which are, again are community organizations active in disasters. And then VOADS, which is volunteer organizations active in disasters. And then Military Relief Society as well. So just give you an idea of some of the um, organizations that are involved in, in, in community capacity and helping with that, uh, not only preparation and mitigation, but that response and recovery after disasters as well. And I also wanted to mention that the FEMA Community Lifelines, this is something that came up in the last session as well, uh, but that the, there's also a level of, of the government also building capacity in the community and helping community recovery as quickly as possible. And one of these is through the Community Lifelines. And these lifelines are the most fundamental service in the community that when stabilized, enable all other aspects of society to function. And you can see there on the bottom, those fundamental services. So the effort to, uh, get those areas back together to help build capacity and help the communities uh, respond and recover after disasters. So this is an integrated network of assets, services, and capabilities that are used day to day to support needs. Uh, in the last session, we talked about, you know, what's the difference between those and the emergency support functions, also known as ESFs. And ESFs and other organizing bodies that you may hear through disaster management are the means that they use in order to get these services back to uh, stabilization. So they are the way to organize across departments and agencies, community organizations and industries to enhance the coordination and integration to deliver the response core capability. So uh, these are just means of making sure that these lifelines are back to a stable process. So now I wanna get into uh, resilience and building capacity can increase resilience. Uh, and so I wanna talk a little bit about the terms first uh, and I'm going to uh, rely on our friend Keith here on some of his work um, to talk about some of the definitions of resilience. And so you may hear different, different types of resilience, especially now we're hearing a little bit about it uh, with COVID-19 as well. But so resistance is the ability of an individual group organization or population to withstand manifestations of clinical distress, impairment, or dysfunction. And resilience is the ability of an individual group organization or population to rebound, to come back from psychological perturbations, both in context of critical incidents, terrorism, and mass disasters as well. Uh, when I first started working in this area and start, started working with some community partners throughout the state of Florida, uh, somebody described resilience to me as community knows what it values and it will work and do whatever they can to get back to it after a disaster. And I thought, wow, that's that's a good way to put it. They know what they value and they're going to work to get back to that level of value within the community. So 
Uh, and you may hear different types of, of resilience. So you'll hear community resilience, you'll hear disaster resilience, but we're also hearing more about individual resilience, uh, especially here in the academic realm. We're hearing a good bit about individual resilience in relation to students and, and how students um, are being individual resilience in this time of COVID-19 uh, in, in addition to all the changes they're going through and uh, in addition to some of the things they may have going on personally too, they're looking at some of that individual resilience also. So just kind of continuing the, the, the conversation regarding resilience, it's used by several different fields. You'll hear it in sociology, public health, disaster medicine, human development, and psychology. But overall, even with these different fields, it's an overall that resilience is actually a collection of several adaptive systems to response to an adverse event, just like Dr. Tidball was saying, to a actual um, mass disaster or terrorist or some sort of critical incident as well. So it's the collection of those several adaptive systems to re respond to that type of event as well. So I, I'm a big fan of, you know, my, my academic side of me, I'm a big fan of the Norris and Stevens um, and some of their authors as well, definition of community resilience, but also some of their model, which I'll show you in just a second. They define community resilience as a process of linking a network of adaptive capacities to adaptation after a disturbance or adversity or an incident, as we talked about. And they looked at four primary sets of adaptive capacity, and that includes economic development, which we know is so important before, during, and after a disaster, information and communications. I'm, I'm a communications person, so I say it always comes back to communication. Uh, and then social capital, which we've talked a lot about different aspects of social capital today, but really understanding the different uh, ca social capital within a community and how it impacts how a community can mitigate and respond and recover after a disaster as well. And then community competence as well. Again, building up that capacity within a community to have the competence to handle some of these things. So I know this kind of looks like a, a scary spider a little bit coming into Halloween, uh, but just to give you, this is the four areas. You'll see the circles, information and communication, community competence, social capital, and then economic development there on the left. And uh, thank you to Coral for breaking these out so we can see them a little bit better. Uh, information and communication, narratives. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about uh, the, the, way that we tell our story and making sure that we tell our, our story and getting the information out there to folks. And sometimes storytelling is really effective in getting some of that information out there. Responsible media. Uh, I used to do media training when I worked at the Jacksonville Zoo. Uh, and I used to, one of the first things I used to say to the folks working at the zoo was me media can be your friend. Uh, and continuous on with some of the research that we do with how folks get information during disasters, we continuously hear that local news uh, is the way they receive their information. So responsible media can be so important during times of a disaster. Skills and infrastructure, make sure it's already there to, in, to ensure that you have that information and communication. And I would also add that make sure that you have a plan B because we all know that communication can go down very quickly in times of a disaster. And then those trusted sources of information. And that's a matter of, of making sure that when you are developing communication materials that you understand your audiences, how do they like to receive information? What's important to them? Uh, and uh, you know, Keith asked earlier about looking at some of the lower SES communities. And this was really important for us to understand how do they like to receive information? What are those trusted sources of information that we can use to make sure they get this crucial information ahead of time? Community competence, the community action, as well as the critical reflection and problem solving skills within a community. Flexibility and creativity, collective efficacy empowerment, and those political partnerships as well. Social capital, and this could be much bigger than it is, but they uh, kind of condensed it so that an active social support, the perceived expected social, social support, support, excuse me, social embeddedness or those informal ties. And then I'm gonna go skip over to the right, the citizen participation, leadership and roles or those formal ties. Organizational linkages and cooperation, the attachment to place, which is so important in so many communities. We see a good bit of that here uh, in Florida, especially those resource dependent communities that are very attached to the place. And then a sense of community. And many of y'all mentioned this, your, your social network and your community and, and your neighbors and your community and the folks that you identify with, that you live with. And then lastly, economic development, fairness of risk and vulnerability to hazards, level of diversity to economic resources and equity of resource distribution as well, very important. 
So I'm going to get a little into some of the social capital and specifically looking at some of the social networks of resilience um, and thinking about uh, social capital. We, we need to look at some of the social networks as well. And so you'll see the bonding capital tends to be those folks that we're very close with. These are our neighbors, our family, those folks. And, they, and you can see it kind of looks like a star there on your, on your left of the screen. And those are your bonds. And the bridges are the bridges that go in between those particular, maybe you're uh, reaching out to somebody in another county. And then the linking capital tends to be the partnerships between the formal and informal partnerships. So for instance, you have um, individuals that are all of a sudden working with a nonprofit within the area. So it tends to be that informal and non-form or informal and, and formal linkages within a community basically. And it tends to be hierarchy. You can see they're, they're going vertical uh, as well. And we'll, I'll talk about these in a little bit to help you understand these. So bonding and bridging capital, bonding can be your friends, neighbors, those that typically associate with one another, your coworkers. Bridging can be friendships outside of a location, outside of a county, outside of maybe your military community, different associations, networks, organizations, and again, outside of your community or county. And then I love the chart to the right about regarding the bond, different words used with bonding and bridges as well. So we've actually done a couple of social networks analysis um, in some counties here in Florida. This is a rural county in Florida and you can see it's very bonded. They are a very close knit community and they, uh, you can see we, each dot represents uh, a connection they have with each other. And you can see that they are, they are very closely bonded with one another. <laughs> But this is kind of what you want to see. You want to see the goals and the bridges and the linking where it looks more like a spider web. Uh, so you, so those bonds, you can still see the bonds there in the blue and the black. You can still see those bonds, but then you see the bridges and the links as well. So I love this uh, particular uh, infographic by the University of Minnesota. And I think it really explains the differences with the bridges and the linking and the bonding networks as well. And linking is often that connection, like I said, between your formal and your informal networks. And it's a matter of, of bringing all of this together and coming together with strengths and shared responsibility to recover or, or to prepare and to recover and to develop plans to increase resiliency within a community. Uh, and many of these often cut across the different powers, so the different bridging networks, the linking networks and the bonding networks and community organization that connects with a government organization or funder can definitely be a linking network. And it oftentimes is a hierarchy as well. So you're, you're definitely go, go, going up to, to uh, a different organization or a governmental service. Um, so it's a, a hierarchy level also when you're thinking about linkages. So thinking about bonding bridges and linking capitals, I'm going to ask you all a series of questions here. So bear with me. So what do bonding capitals look like with military families? And these are your bonding capitals, just to refresh your memory, are those close connections and those common social backgrounds. Base housing. OK, great. Yeah. Neighbors. Wonderful. So geez, unit neighborhoods, okay. Church, yes, yeah. spouse clubs, divisions with commands, absolutely. Key spouse programs, supports. Ombudsman, wonderful. Happen regular school connections, parent network, very, very good. That's a good one. ACS, schools, yeah, that's a good one. Okay, so I'm gonna. Ask now, so what did those linking capitals look like within military families? And again, these are connections to organizations and systems. It oftentimes can be an informal, informal system connecting with a formal system. So what kind of linkings do y'all see with those as well? ACS, FFSC, FSC, okay. Family support, okay. American Legion, great. Commodity service, churches and clubs. Yep. BFW, military one source. That was one of the things that we talked about was a community resource, USO. Counseling associations, good. Supports those that don't live on post, but communities with organizations, very good. 
Okay, so my, my last question, I got, I got y'all answering a lot of questions today. So what do bridging capitals look like with military families? And again, thinking about those bridges, these are the broad connections with the ability to expand. These folks have different social backgrounds, um, different social backgrounds, but they have the ability to, to expand to other areas. So it could be somebody in another county or um, what do those look like? Personal finance counts and multiple resources, nonprofit alliances, absolutely. Churches, readiness, USAA, okay. MFLC, great. Programs like Team Rubicon, absolutely. American Red Cross, yes. These are good, and you'll see a lot of the a lot of the folks that y'all mentioned can be mentioned for bridges and bonds, and and a lot of uh, community organizations, especially your nonprofit organizations, uh, they do focus on that of how do we build um, community with where we are, but then how do we also expand uh, those communities so that they can have best management practices and resources with other areas as well, and 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 trying to fill needs and and meet gaps in communities also. Nonprofit groups, great. So I think, uh, so how, any ideas on how we can create more links and bridges, especially with military um, families and military uh, communities? Outreach programs, volunteer and donate, volunteer, that's a great one, absolutely. Join events with communities, YMCA, yes, they're, they're, they do a great job of uh, making connections. Contact them for a good resource list, coalition, open communication. Local Cooperative Extension 4-H, absolutely. Social media, fantastic, absolutely. Great, some good ones, thank you. And, and just wanted to touch on some additional programs and some of these are things that I have seen and become involved with, especially after disasters here in Florida are art programs. Uh, uh, there's several rural communities in Northwest Florida that have really focused on uh, art programs and have uh, formed plein air and they have had artists come in and uh, do, do art from that particular community. And it, it has brought several counties together and communities together and also has brought tourists to the area as well. Uh, so it's been an, a unique project that I've seen folks uh, do after disasters as well. Community greening, uh, community gardening, as well as community forestry and natural naturalist programs, uh, which are offered through Extension as well. And then partnership with other youth organizations around the state, obviously Extension of 4-H development, communicate, community restoration work, uh, youth core programs uh, here within Florida as well as some of the Gulf Coast states, we have Conservation Corps where uh, the youth are involved in, in, in rebuilding after disasters, but also in helping in conservation projects and also living memorials as well. So are there, are there other things that you've seen in your own communities after disasters that helped in recovery after disasters, other programs that maybe I didn't mention here? Oh, the Crestage Foundation, yep. Lions Club, yeah, yeah. Continue reaching out, absolutely. Local fraternity and sorority chapters, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, they, a lot of them do have those community service projects. That's a great point. Counselors going out to talk to kids, Faith-based outreach, yes. Freemasons and Order of Eastern Stars, good. Air Force Aid Society, good. I know a lot of those uh, different branches of the military have those aid societies, so it's wonderful. Great, Jack and Jill. Well, I'm gonna uh, wrap up here, and I, and I love this particular graphic that is from the Community Capacity website that we gave earlier on the Military Family Learning Network website, and it's helping you build community capacity. And I, and I think that how can we work together to better prepare, mitigate, and recovery, and, and looking at what other uh, communities are doing and look at what other organizations are doing, and how can we use those strengths um, within our communities to help each other and identify and develop areas where people can help each other. Uh, and I talked about that collaboration and communication with another organization uh, that you come together to build community capacity within these communities. Sharing your stories. We talked about the narrative with communication and how important it is to get uh, your message out there, but also to share those stories, the good stories that take the time to celebrate, especially in the time of a global pandemic like this. Some folks, we need to hear some of the good news and take the time to celebrate and communicate that good news as well. 
And, and I think of one way of looking at whole community is, is to plan ahead of time to to look at those different organizations that we can collaborate with now in order to meet those anticipated needs after disasters and looking at recovery and response after disasters. And so how can we plan and how can we plan ahead of time to work with those individual organizations that have the strengths that uh, may work really well within your organization to meet them the needs after a disaster as well. Um, and, and preparing for disasters, and I'm, I'm trying, kind of given a little advertisement for the last session here, but I think it's so important in looking at building capacity and building resilience that you that you have a plan and that includes planning for the disaster, but also planning for the response and planning for recovery as well. Uh, I, I'd love to say our, our extension dean here at University of Florida, when we start first uh, went on lockdown for COVID-19, he said we're we are building an airplane while we're while we're flying it. And I think he's exactly right. We're living in a time of teachable moments here in, in COVID-19, and especially true right now as we're living with this global global pandemic. That it's incorporate important to incorporate the different Im impacts and plans, and to look at those impacts and plans, uh, the different impacts that we've talked about today and plan ahead for those social and mental impacts. Um, be proactive about it. Think about those things that you individually like to do or families do or things that the community can do such as art or community gardens as well uh, that can provide some of that social or mental um, impact break as well. And then also, and I know this is so hard, I know it's been hard for me too, take note of what is being done and what has worked. Uh, what has worked and that that maybe you can put into a plan later on that look this worked really well for us when we were going through COVID-19 maybe it will work well when the next time we're impacted with a weather or a climate disaster as well and just be aware of all the impacts a lot of them that we talked about today make it a top of conversation especially your mental health not just secondary after the physical and then think about at all level of disaster preparedness mitigation and recovery I think a lot of times people forget to plan for recovery. We think about how are we gonna mitigate, especially in storms here in Florida, how are we gonna mitigate through the storm? But think about recovery too. Uh, how, how best are we gonna get through recovery? And think about internally and externally, especially within your organizations, thinking about your own employees as well, but also how are you gonna help your stakeholders and, and reach out to the folks that uh, look to you for services or information as well. And so I'm gonna leave with some final thoughts what unique characteristics and barriers might exist in developing a comprehensive plan for a disaster for military families? And lastly, how do we best work with military families to ensure they plan for many different impacts due to different types of hazards as well? So just some, just some things to think about going into session three for November. So thank y'all very much. Thank you very much, Angie. That was an incredible um, presentation, wide ranging across a number of important concepts for us to, to get our minds wrapped around and to really think through this, this question of what are the unique challenges that military families and practitioners who work with military families are going to be dealing with in the case of hazards and disasters. So uh, I think what I'd like to do now is, is sort of transition into um, a kind of case study that I'll, that I'll present, which will, I hope, uh, spur some additional discussion. I see an incredible amount of good information and ideas coming in the chat. I hope people will stick around for a few more minutes to, to hear about this. Um, and so I guess I'm not surprised to hear, even 15 years later, so much conversation in the chat and, and, and even in your presentation, Angie, about Hurricane Katrina and, and, and how that all, uh, um, affected folks. Um, I was not in the National Guard at that time. I had taken a, a brief break in service and was actually in New Orleans after Katrina for uh, response and research work. I actually did my PhD field work in uh, post-Katrina New Orleans. And um, even though my work was not directly related to the military, it was impos impossible to avoid interaction with the military because it was such a, a large response. Uh, anybody familiar um, that's that's still with us now? Anybody familiar with Jackson Barracks down there in in New Orleans? Uh, if you're if you're not, uh, Jackson Barracks is the. I see a couple people say that they are. Great. Uh, then you know that uh, first of all, that's a very historic facility there in the in the uh, Lower Ninth Ward. Um, I think it goes back to about 1834 when it was when it was first uh, when it was first built or put into service. Um, and it was and is, all right, there's somebody there now, outstanding, uh, was and is the headquarters of the, the Louisiana National Guard. 
Um, so that's some interesting backstory. Uh, they, they were involved, I believe the Joint Force Headquarters is also there, um, or now it, only in part, but at the time during Hurricane Katrina was, was all located there. And um, during the storm surge, they were, they were managing okay. They had pre-positioned a lot of uh, material there to be able to respond to the storm. And then the um, industrial canal levee broke and suddenly Jackson Barracks um, found itself under about 20 feet of water. Um, so, so suddenly the capacity for the, for the Louisiana National Guard to respond uh, was compromised, especially given coordination and, 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 um, and communication that was supposed to be happening out of that Joint Force Headquarters. Um, and what was also interesting about that, my recollection was there were a number of, of military families that were either in residence there or very nearby that were directly affected. Now, I, I'm, I'm telling this story because I'm, I'm relating um, Hurricane Katrina and our experiences with it. And some folks are in the chat box right now who, who are actually thinking about this and also preparing for, for Zeta, I see. I'm relating this to the one of those early slides, Angie, that, that you had in there in terms of what is so unique about the military uh, exper experience of, of disaster. And my recollection there was, you know, we had probably on the order of um, 50,000 National Guard troops when all was said and done coming through uh, that portion of Louisiana. Many, many uh, of those troops uh, had families there in New Orleans or nearby or somewhere on the Gulf Coast that were affected. They were rolling through neighborhoods where their own family members, relatives, et cetera's homes were, were completely destroyed or in the street and were going to have to uh, respond to that. So at the, at the very same moment that they're in uniform rolling through the streets of, of their home city, um, they're looking at their families attempting to cope with these disasters. So I, I raise this point to say um, these, these issues are not something that we can, we can take lightly in terms of the effects of disasters on military families, especially when those military families, spouses or, or parents or brothers and sisters are actually having to deploy. I'm curious, Angie, uh, given, given those observations, and I have a few more observations along that line, I'm curious though, in your personal experience with some of the things that you responded to, you know, what did you, what did you actually see or experience that, you, that, that, that stands out to you that helps us drive home the point of how important it is for those of us that are working with military families to help military families prepare for all hazards? You, you know, Keith, I'm, I'm going to go back to the mental health because uh, it was something for me that was really hard to see. And as someone who's not a clinical psychologist and, and you know, not a counselor, I was not sure how best to help um, to help the, these folks that had truly just lost their home and weren't real sure what to do, basically. And, and we're just truly not um, other than giving them a hug and saying, I'm here for you. And, you know, here's some water, but they, they needed more than that. And uh, I will say it was something that we really talked about here uh, at the University of Florida and with extension of how best can we prepare our, our extension folks for, for helping others in that way as well. And we did, uh, we have been trying to get our folks uh, trained through the mental health first aid so that they have some tools in their toolbox of helping know some of the right things to say. Cause I just, I remember thinking, am I going to say the right, wrong thing? But I think it's just so important to take into account when you're putting some of these plans together to think about some of those mental impacts that um, are, are really hard. And a lot of times because of the mental impacts, I think folks can't think through what to do physically sometimes. I think you get called up in some of the anxiety and get called up, oh my gosh, this happened to me, that it's hard to put one foot in front of the other. And, and, and it's understandably why it's so hard to put one foot in front of the other. So um, I know it sounds weird to plan for mental health impacts, but I think it's important to really think through what some of those impacts might be and some of the ways that each individual as well as family and organizations can think about ways to, to address those not in addition to the physical impacts, not after the, the physical impacts. I think that, that's, a, that's a great uh, response. And I, I, don't, I don't think it's um, particularly weird to think about preparing for the mental effects 
Um, you know, I, I believe that, you know, some of the statements you're making regarding uh, uh, psychological first aid training and so forth are, are actually things that we need to figure out how to action. I do remember also um, while I was down there and I spent probably two years doing field work in the recovery process of, of, of Katrina, I remember that the 256th uh, IBCT had just gotten back from a, a rotation in Iraq and, um, and they literally like two or three days before Katrina hit, they, they had just come back and there were some pretty significant, you know, layer upon layer of, of psychological impacts for those folks. Um, so, so, so given that, I think well, one of the questions I have for those that remain in the audience, and it seems like there's a, a good amount of chatter still there, which, which is great. What do we need to do to action the, the things that we've learned from you, Angie, and from the things that we're learning from each other in the chat? What do we, what do we as practitioners who work with military families need to start with? Um, and, and, you know, I always like the, you know, begin with the end in mind approach of leadership. What is the, what is the end state we need for military families in the context of disaster and readiness and hazard and so forth? And what are the steps that we can, we can take, take? And, and I guess I'm asking those of you who are, are watching right now to, to, to let us know, tell us what, what you need right now, uh, to be able to start addressing this question, not only in terms of the physical security and some of the go bag issues you know, that we were talking about, but also in terms of that, you know, uh, proactive mental health measures uh, and so forth that, that would need to be, be put in place. I'm gonna be watching uh, what the chat uh, has to say. I have, I have an, uh, uh, an observation also, uh, Angie, again, to, to, to sort of pick your brain a little more. When I compare and contrast my experience in, in uh, New Orleans after Katrina with, with another, um, perturbation, if you will, which was Hurricane Sandy in New York City, there was a pretty pretty extreme difference in that um, there had been some major changes in the way the military responded to uh, national natural disasters, including um, not, um, not having uh, federal Title X uh, folks respond immediately, which they did in the case of, of New Orleans. And also we, we noticed in, in uh, Hurricane Sandy that the, the command center and the joint task force and everything was far away from, from New York City where, where most of the damage was occurring. Instead, it was in, 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 um, in Albany. But we still saw uh, the same kind of, of fatigue in terms of response and recovery among military uh, service members and their families, despite some of those sort of logistical um, considerations that were put in place, lessons learned basically from Katrina. So a quite another question I had to have for you regarding some of the things that you were talking about uh, in, in social networks and community capacity. Did you, did you experience in your travels that there were certain things that were absolutely critically important in terms of developing and maintaining social networks or community capacity in the either uh, response or recovery stages? Communication, definitely. Um, I definitely found that uh, Folks just wanted to be able to, to, to talk to one another and make sure, and this, and this includes making sure that their fam, that let them, letting them know their families that, that they were okay, but also wanting to make sure that their neighbors were okay, that uh, the folks that, I mean, especially for people that evacuated, uh, they were very, very anxious to, to communicate again, to be able to have that communication. And after Hurricane Michael, I know uh, several folks are, uh, are, on today that are from that particular area. I mean, there was cell service down. And so some folks really did not have cell service. And I remember one of our extension agents, I didn't even know you could do this. He literally called me on Facebook. He got uh, uh, information, he got a, a Wi-Fi line somewhere and I got a phone call from Facebook. <laughs> I didn't even know you could do that, but it was that that need, that want to, to communicate and the inability to, to communicate with each other was, from what I, what we saw was, was scary. So it was not being able to, not being able to connect with your families, but also with your bonds, with that social network of the people that you work with or you live next door to. So that communication was so important. So. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, and I, I guess that, that leads me to a question, um, you know, in your experience, and, and it certainly I, I can say from my experience, I have not seen um, what I would call a playbook or a recipe for military families, both at the preparation standpoint um, or phase and in the response and recovery, we're sort of hitting all the pieces that should be part of that recipe or playbook. 
um, is it, that's my experience that it really doesn't or hasn't existed, or if it does, it's it's um, pretty superficial. What is what is your experience? Have you seen that? And I'm I'm leading this to a question about perhaps we need to get to work on on creating something with the people here that are that are uh, uh, with us in this in this uh, session. I I have not seen this, and, and I I kind of uh, laugh to myself because this is something that we have talked about. Uh, with even with an extension of do we have a, a playbook that we turn to uh, and every every county is different so it's hard to do that and I imagine a, uh, every military community is different as well but I think there are some foundational things that we can put into a playbook that at least guides through make sure you're thinking about this or make sure you're thinking about this as well so uh, but it's something that we've talked about but I'm not aware either no Okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a, a lot of conversation in the chat uh, regarding some personal experience and some, some uh, major stressors, economic and otherwise. Um, I also see a, a quote um, uh, here or a comment uh, regarding um, the chain of command providing some resources to assist and so forth. Um, I'm thinking that based on this conversation, Angie, that, that there may be an opportunity for our partners here on this on this uh, session, as well as our DoD and USDA partners, to really uh, lean forward and produce some sort of um, military families uh, community capacity in times of disaster and and so forth. That is a roadmap. Uh, that is a guide. Um, and and I'm interested if those in in the audience here today that are with us would find that to be useful. So let me know if, if that would be a useful tool. Um, obviously every chain of command, every commander in, in, a, in an installation post or even in, you know, in National Guard, a joint force a headquarters would, uh, would have some say in this and, and how much it's used, but at least to have a roadmap or, or a guide or um, a recipe, if you were a playbook or whatever metaphor you wanna use uh, to get us, get us moving. Uh, I, I certainly uh, would, would think that that would be important. I'm seeing that there's some positive uh, response to that in the chat as well. Um, so I think that some next steps for us then, given that, um, would be to think through um, how we might do that, what sort of partnerships are going to be required to do that. And I'm, I'm, I'm in love with the fact that we've got so much to, to, to uh, work through in the chat just in today's session, never mind the last one we had last month with good suggestions and, and things to consider. So um, what, I would, what I would ask of, of you, Angie, and, and those of us that are part of this is that we, that we think about that um, and that we, we come up with a game plan on how we might proceed uh, to, to create that, that roadmap. Let me just take a look at some of the comments in here. There are some, some suggestions to use the experience in, in Puerto Rico with, with Hurricane uh, Maria. Uh, there's a number of uh, other um, uh, suggestions in here. I, it's, it's, there are so many good suggestions, it's actually hard to keep up. I look forward to reading this again uh, when we're not live. Um, and, and there's a suggestion from um, Jaka, I think that's how you might pronounce that, on, on uh, some work working with FEMA and their family readiness communities. I think we would want to do that in, in tandem with their Emergency Management Institute. Uh, one other thing I, I will mention from, from my experience uh, in both Katrina and Sandy was that uh, when we looked in the rearview mirror on both of those, on both of those responses, um, there, there really was not uh, a lot of synergy. Um, there was plenty of cooperation between FEMA and military uh, service members and their, and their chains of command. I feel like there was less between FEMA uh, community recovery resources and military families, especially those who had been in, in, involved in the response or the recovery um, missions. So there may be another uh, opportunity for us to, to work on some additional partnerships where FEMA could focus some of their community recovery resources directly on military families. Angie, did you notice in your uh, travels in various uh, disasters and hazard response that there was uh, any particular federal or even state programming that was directed towards military families who were a part of or swept up in some of these uh, these um, disasters? No, not that I can recall. No, no. Okay. Um, I'm seeing that uh, Amy is talking about um, reserve and National Guard members that are connected with FEMA Red Cross within their civilian employment. So those would be those would be some resources and some individuals to talk to about 
how we can better make this handshake or crosswalk specifically for military families. Um, and, and I also see uh, that uh, Kathy is, is, is confirming that uh, there could be more uh, cooperation and coordination of resources in, in that sense. So I, I think that um, based on uh, the conversation we've had today and some of what we're hearing from our colleagues in, in the chat, there are um, some great opportunities for not only the Military Families Learning Network and for those practitioners who are working directly with military families, but probably more broadly for the cooperative extension system writ large uh, as a part of USDA and for DOD military family readiness to start to think through what a program uh, and a playbook might look like. You know, obviously I'm not committing in any federal agency to any, any uh, resources or any, any, any um, uh, future objective, but it does seem that, you know, based on what you've said and based on what our colleagues here who are, are with us today are saying, there's a need for something like this. Um, last question I have for you, Angie, uh, based on, uh, on what, we've, what we've been talking about, and this is probably something that folks in the chat uh, will also be uh, interested in, is if, if you had to, looking back now, if you had to um, provide a, a single piece of advice to a, to a military family member who is experiencing something like we're hearing uh, in the chat where their lives are disrupted, they don't have uh, you know, financial means to relocate after a major disruption like this and a spouse is deployed and not able to actually help with the basics after the flood levels uh, uh, um, um, go down. Uh, what single piece of advice, based on your experience, would you give a military family member in, in that context? So just, just from my experience and some of the things that, that we dealt with after Hurricane Michael is the um, take the help. Uh, you know, ask for the help if you need it and take the help. Uh, I know uh, many of us are very proud and, and I'm sure there's a lot of military families that are very proud as well. And, oh, I can handle this, but uh, you've just been impacted by, by, by a disaster and, and, it's, and it's very impactful and there's, uh, it could have physical damage as well as some mental health issues as well. And just take the help. There's organizations out there that are, that are willing to help and there's uh, people out there that are willing to help. And, and, and I would suggest that to, to look for those areas that, that can offer some help and, and take the help until you get back on your feet. Absolutely. That's good suggestions. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm very impressed with a lot of the, the, the comments here that sort of align with what you just described, Angie. Um, I would like to, before we sort of move towards uh, uh, of concluding this, just to, just to let um, the, the people who are still with us address either you, Angie, or myself directly with a, with a question or a comment. Uh, so, uh, or, or, or some f further clarification from my experience, for example, in, in Katrina or, or Sandy or your experience, Angie, and, and numerous other uh, disasters. Um, are there any questions that you wanna direct, at, direct to either of us right now before we move to uh, concluding this, this session of, of the MFRA? Anyone? Thank you for the, for the compliment, Alicia. Anyone have a question or a comment that they would like for us to uh, directly address? If not, or maybe there'll, there'll be some coming in here. Um, uh, here's a question from Bridget. Uh, uh, and I think I might've seen this earlier. Do they still use memorandum of agreements or MOAs between the military and civilian communities? These were always outdated or dragged out for years. Those are supposed to be used. Uh, and I, and uh, I know that there are some that are in place. It is true that many of them don't get dusted off until uh, something bad is going on. And then, and it, then it becomes obvious that uh, they're, they need to be updated. Um, that's a good point. Whoever raised that point, uh, one of the things that we can do in Blue Skies is make sure that those MOAs are up, up to date. Uh, uh, and, and that's generally on the commander. Uh, and it's one of those things that sort of um, can slide when, when change of command happens. A very, very good point, and that should be part of the playbook. Um, there's a question about housing emergency response agencies. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't understand your question entirely. I, I think, um, Angie, feel free to chime in here, but housing emergency response agencies should, should be more plugged into what military needs might be and what military family needs might be 
And perhaps that requires some education that happens uh, at the local level to them so that they're prepared to uh, handle uh, the, the needs and issues of military families. Um, there are a lot of people thanking us for what we've pre presented today. And I wanna thank you all for what you have contributed to this. Uh, there is a question from Sonia. During natural disasters, what is the biggest challenge you experience in assisting those affected? Food, finances, mental health. Uh, you wanna hit that one first, Angie, and then I'll, I'll follow up with you. Sure. Um, and yeah, I, I hate to keep bringing it up, but definitely uh, mental health was one of the biggest things. Cause I, um, and I, I don't think I talked about this in the last one, but I was getting emails from uh, folks around the state, especially after Hurricane Irma. And we had, uh, they were working with a lot of their citrus farmers who had just gone through citrus screening, which was a disease on citrus uh, plants, but they were meeting with citrus farmers after Hurricane Irma to make sure they were okay. And the citrus farmers were talking about committing suicide. And so I always have extension folks call me and say, how do I respond to this? And I said, I, I don't know. Like, I, I really did not know. And it was tough for me. And luckily I worked down the hall from a clinical psychologist. So I pulled her into my office and said, help, you know, how do we, how do we help these that have been impacted? So I, I would definitely say um, mental health was definitely something that, especially after Hurricane Irma um, and Irma and Michael, both that, that were something that were big challenges for us that, um, that we're, we're still trying to work on. And like I said, working with mental health first aid and psychological first aid is some, some great recommendations there too. Yeah, and, and I would answer the question, you, you put up some interesting slides having to do with social capitals and sort of broke those down a little bit. What I noticed, and this was especially true in my research is that one of the biggest challenges that people face after a few weeks have gone by in terms of their place attachment and so forth is the lack of those things that often are taken for granted, the green infrastructure, important trees, important parks, opportunities to breathe fresh air, you know, green things of any kind as opposed to brown things and gray things and black things as a result of recovery uh, of infrastructure. And I saw that in New Orleans and I saw that in Sandy and I saw that in Joplin after we responded to that tornado and, and on and on and on. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is to prioritize that green infrastructure when everybody's busy trying to get the lights back on and the water to run again. But it does seem to have a major impact psychologically on, on, on disaster survivors, military families or otherwise. That, that uh, in answer to that earlier question, um, that, that was one of the biggest challenges. And I think the more we can pre-plan to make sure that that piece of our morale and welfare can be restored as quickly as electricity and water, the better we're doing in terms of, of, of some of, the, of those morale and, and mental health issues. Somebody did ask a question, and this will be the, the last one I think we can hit given the time. Um, the, the, my thoughts on COVID-19, and, and I think Angie it would be important for, for you to give this too, and, and this will be a little teaser because we're going to do a deeper dive on this uh, later uh, in another session that, that you may hear about uh, very soon. But I, I, I would uh, often categorize uh, hazards and disasters in, in terms of two baskets. These are there is the, the short burn kind or the slow burn kind. And, and often we're, we're, we're used to uh, the, the quick fuse kinds which strike suddenly, whether there are uh, hurricanes or earthquakes or, or major fires, et cetera. Um, pandemics and long droughts and famines are these, these slow burn uh, disasters that are much more difficult to get our arms wrapped around and our heads wrapped around and they just continue to to suck resources and energy and mental uh, um, and emotional uh, strength and as a, as a result it's a different kind of a, a response and a different kind of planning and I don't think that in in it's it's probably been a long time since our uh, our um, leaders have spent time thinking through what does the mental health piece of, of, a, of, a, of a slow burn disaster need to look like. And so, you know, my thoughts on COVID-19 right now are that we are probably woefully underprepared to deal with some of the, the mental implications of, of not only those that have been responding to, to COVID-19, but this, those that are enduring. Uh, COVID-19. Um, those are my thoughts on that. Angie, do you have, what are your thoughts on, on uh, the question was about uh, COVID-19? I agree. I think uh, just to give a, um, an example, um, sorry, 
um, just to give an example, we actually just released a, um, um, a mental health first aid, particularly um, a mental health first aid class that we're going to do here in um, Florida. And we only had 20 spots and we sold out within two days. Uh, so I think there's a great need for uh, that, that mental health need and folks are actually looking for it um, desperately right now. So, um, so yeah, I agree. I feel like that, that we are woefully unprepared for, a, for, for, what's in, for what's ahead of us and what we're dealing with right now. I, I hope that that's not a, a depressing uh, thing to end on. I think that the way we can get prepared is to do what we're suggesting together as a, as a group here, that the, the, the two of us, I think the, the MFLN more, more broadly and all of us assembled, and that is that we need to work together to develop a playbook uh, and, and a roadmap for how we, as those that serve military families and, and, and service members, how we navigate both the, the, the uh, fast, burn and the slow burn types of, of disaster and hazards so that uh, community capacity manifests itself as community resilience and we have a, a, a strong and, and resilient response to these things. Um, with that, I think that I will thank you once again, Angie, for these comments that you've made and for your sharing your expertise and experiences with us. Um, I always find it useful and helpful and I've always find things to chew on intellectually when you when you bring these things. And I think that uh, others probably have too. Uh, I thank the audience very much. You guys have been great, uh, great questions, great comments, and really appreciate some of the side discussions and, and, and helping each other uh, find new resources and so forth. I hope you will continue to lean on the Military Families Learning Network for more of that. And obviously we can, we can promise you that we will facilitate more conversations like this as, as time goes forward. And with that, I will say, uh, good afternoon or good evening, and uh, and turn it back over to to Coral. Keith, Angie, thank you both so much for another incredible installment on our discussion as we continue to explore disaster and hazard preparedness in the context of how we can support military families and their readiness. So we do invite you to join us for our third and final session in part one of our Military Families Readiness Academy Fall Series. It'll be on November 18th and in, in this session we'll be tying together all of the aspects involved in military family readiness, both from a family as well as a service professional perspective. For more information, you can visit the Session 3 webpage and we'll pop that link in the chat here in just a moment for your reference. Additionally, as we have alluded to a couple times throughout today's session, uh, we are going to be continuing our discussion in uh, this context during our 2021 Military Family Readiness Academy and registration for this extension of our conversation is now open. Disaster and Hazard Readiness in Action will focus on the skills, contexts, and situations military family service providers may draw from and navigate as they manage disasters and emergencies within their professional fields, respectively. A continuation from the 2020 Academy Series Disaster and Hazard Readiness uh, Foundations, participants can choose from a range of sessions that offer guidance on how to work effectively with military families during disasters and hazards, and many will draw from recent ongoing situations providers are facing during this COVID-19 pandemic. We're also offering, excuse me, we're also offering the Community Recovery and Resilience Workshop. Uh, there are three different opportunities to engage in this piece as well. Uh, this is part of the 2021 Academy Series experience. And so this workshop will facilitate small group discussions focused on what we've learned as providers uh, working during the COVID-19 pandemic, and this will have an ultimate goal of creating resources we can all use as we continue to provide services and support to military families. So to register and find out uh, additional session information, please visit the MFRA 2021 homepage, which is now live. 
Today's session is approved for a number of continuing education credits, including FinCert, AFCPE, Certified Family Life Educators, Registered Dietitians, and Dietetic Technicians, uh, also by the Commission for Case Managers and for Social Work Licensed Professional Counselors and Licensed Marriage and Family Therapists from the UT Austin Steve Hicks School of Social Work. To ob obtain continuing education credit or a certificate of completion, go to the session page, and then from there, follow the purple continuing education button, which is under that section header. This will take you to the evaluation. Once you've completed the evaluation for today's session, a list will appear on the available continuing education options. All you need to do is follow the link and or links in which you are interested in obtaining CE credit for. For each continuing education option you submit for, you will receive an email at the address you provide with a certificate for that credential or certificate. If you have any questions regarding continuing education or having any, any hiccups with that process, you can uh, reach out to Kathleen Halavity at kzh0030 at auburn.edu and I'll also pop that uh, email address in the chat here in just one moment. To bridge our conversation between sessions, we would invite you to subscribe to the MFRA Outpost for exclusive content related to our discussions. And you can also deepen your discussion reflection as well as engage with one another and with us and our team, as well as network with other practitioners by joining us on the uh, Outpost Online. To enroll for the Outpost Online, just head over to mfln.thinkific.com. And finally, to conclude, we invite you to explore other resources, both upcoming and archived from the Military Families Learning Network, and they are available across a whole host of areas supporting military family readiness. And you can find out more on our MFLN website, militaryfamilieslearningnetwork.org. Thank you again, everyone, so much for joining us today. A massive thank you to Dr. Angie Lindsay and Dr. Keith Tidball for an incredible installment and discussion today. We wish you a wonderful day. We'll stay on for just a couple more minutes to wrap up any remaining items in the chat. However, I uh, also would like to let everyone know that today's session was recorded. Session one was recorded as well in case you need to go back and review any of the content we've covered or you would like to share any of this information with colleagues who may be benefit uh, from this discussion. So in case you missed it earlier, I've just posted that link to session two, our homepage for today's session. This is where you can head over to that event page, scroll down to the continuing education segment, and you'll find the continuing education button there. So again, just click on the continue education button and that will take you to the evaluation, complete that. And then subsequently you will see that list of all the available continuing education opportunities. Um, Again, if you're having any difficulties with the CE options, please just reach out to Kathleen Halavity at the email address that's listed on the slide, and we'll certainly be able to assist you offline. So thanks again for tuning in. Have a wonderful rest of your day, a great week, and we'll see you again soon.
All right, we're going to officially close out the room for today's session. Again, we do invite you to join us for session three. If you have any questions in the meantime, please don't hesitate to reach out to our MFLN team. And we do hope to see you in conversation with the Outpost online in the interim as well. Take care, stay well, and we'll see you again soon.